this this um, discussion. This is I'm, I'm not proposing this as a lecture by any, by any means, but it certainly discussion is is quite um, quite broad, and we've tried to narrow it in terms of the specific issues that we're working in as part of the Asian Cities Climate Change Resilience Network that I'll get into. Uh, my background personally is uh, political economy and urban planning, so um, it puts me probably close to where some of you have come from and very far from others. Um, but it's certainly in this work, in sort of urban governance challenges, in urban challenges, in, in, um, in approaching climate change and the impacts on cities, I think there's, there's certainly a, a range of skills and, and exp uh, professional expertise that's required in order to understand that. And I'll get into that a little bit more. So um, urban systems and vulnerability, lots of uh, issues sort of tied up in those kind of terminology, but I'll get, I'll get into breaking those down as, as quickly as possible. Um, so this is the starting point, I guess, this, the sort of structure for how we understand uh, the impact of climate change on cities. And there's three steps to this, and I'll, I'll explain them quite simply. But this looks fairly simple, and uh, you may have seen similar models or similar sort of frames, I suppose. The starting point is to understand existing vulnerability, which we talked about, understanding how the city work, so that's the urban systems, and the, the projected impacts of climate change. Now, we are talking specifically about climate change here. We could expand this to other hazards, and there's no reason why this couldn't, um, couldn't expand into that sort of, uh, into that context. But, but the purpose of this diagram is to really show that with climate change, you have direct impacts on vulnerable groups. So we have a flood on a, uh, on a coastal population. It's a direct impact, potentially. It has the potential for disaster. Very direct. No kind of urban systems elements. The interaction between urban systems and vulnerable groups. So how does the city work? How does it, how does it uh, respond to the needs of its people? Um, how does it meet their objectives, is about, in this case, urban poverty reduction. The, the interaction between climate change and urban systems is about urban climate change risk. So what's, what's the interaction here? What we're trying to get to is understand the indirect impacts around here. So climate change has an impact on, we talked about the transport system, climate change has an impact on a particular system. What does that mean? For the, for the, particularly for the vulnerable groups in this case, but for the rest of the city, the way the other systems work, um, what, are the, what are the actual impacts? So the, for, for us in, uh, in the ACERN program, the interesting thing about this is there's no, there's no order in which you should do this. You don't, there's, we have uh, some climate scientists, quite a few, as part of the program, and they're very keen to start here. We want to know what climate projections are before we can understand before we need to go any further. We can't, um, we can't understand climate change risk in cities without understanding climate change. Others, such as Mercy Corps, who work within Indonesia, they're very focused on urban poverty. And their, their starting point is, what are, the, what are the current vulnerabilities that people face? What are the issues that people face now, regardless of climate change? We can, we can layer that on top, but until we understand what the existing situation is, we can't go any further. And then in India, we have a, a, a partner called Taru, who's sort of an engineering urban planning consultancy. And they're leading the work in India. And their starting point is about, is about how does the city work? What are the systems that enable water supply? What are the systems that enable um, transport, energy to, to flow through the city? And that's the starting point. We can then sort of put climate change over the top and maybe uh, understand the impact on the populations as a result. This is a... Um, very abstract, but for us, quite helpful way of really stepping back and saying, what is it about? How do we simplify the city? How do we really simplify a city into its component parts that we're interested in, that we're interested in using to, to, build, to build resilience, using to sort of identify the sort of entry points? This is based on uh, a range of research around social technical networks and carrying capacity of cities and communities. And basically, this is saying, 
you have your ecosystems, which are the natural resources. That's the basis for which for everything you need to to um, create well-being. You have well-being, which is the outcome of the city. And these are your sort of um, your mediating functions, your networks. So institutions, your sort of rules, regulations, culture, religion, sort of why why things happen in a city. Knowledge, knowledge networks. This is about how does information. Um, how does information move around the city? How, does, how do people uh, transfer their own knowledge and, and learn within a city? And that's not just about people, it's about systems and, and infrastructure. And then there's the actual, I guess, the physical elements of the city. This has got, um, when we were talking about this, Victoria's sort of raised, it's very similar to a sort of five, um, five capitals model that you might, you might be familiar with. It wasn't developed that way, but it's, but it's again drawing out those different elements. But it's, but it's the relationships, it's the sort of mediating functions here, and this sort of simple. And we use the hamburger. I'll explain why we use the hamburger I in a second. But it's um, just trying to show that 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 it's about it's about a flow, I suppose, or, or a series of flows. This hamburger may represent a um, an island, a self-sufficient island, where you have all your resources you need. You have your infrastructure, you have your institutions, you have your sort of, I think somebody mentioned closed system before. Everything's kind of working. And this was based on some of the uh, resource efficiency models that, that Arup and others have, have developed. What the sort of triple cheeseburger model shows, um, and this is why it becomes, this is why we, we came up with a hamburger. It just shows that within a, within a, leave this to the side for a second, but within a city, you, you're going beyond the carrying capacity of your, um, of your boundaries, of your areas of control. You can't source the, the resources you need um, within the city boundaries in order to, to meet the needs of your population. It's kind of one of the almost definitions of a city, uh, as it is now anyway. So, so you need to go beyond the area of control. And this is not, and you can think about this as, uh, a ward or a suburb, you can think about this as a local government area, you can think about this as a, a metropolitan government area. But you have to go beyond your boundary, whatever that is, to access the resources you need. To go beyond that boundary, you then need your rules and regulations, your cultures, your way of, your way of acting. You need knowledge, how do people know what they need, how is that transferred, and your infrastructure to actually get it there. And that can kind of go on and on. There's different, I guess, different ways of representing this. But basically, it's ta it's we could do this spatially. You can say you access a city accesses its water systems generally outside its boundary. Um, so there needs to be a relationship between the city who needs the water and the provider of that water that's outside the boundary. Um, so that's the the sort of it's very abstract. I appreciate that, but we're also trying to break down what it is. You know, how can we simplify a city? And that's uh, that's quite a difficult thing to do, I think. Are there any questions about that? Does it make sense? Maybe it'll be very abstract. If not, I'll move on. And I'm. Um, one of the things we talk about resilience, and I'm sure those of you who study with John. Um, are aware that there's many different ways of thinking about characteristics of resilience. Uh, and this is the last sort of piece of theory before we get back to practice. But this is some of the work that we did and the, some of the work that we've been doing is about identifying an, a starting point for identifying what's different between a vulnerable system and a resilient system. And characteristics is one way of getting to that. In this, in this, in this work that we've done, We've identified capacities, which are more human characteristics, and the sort of characteristics on this side, which are more, uh, I guess, uh, more about infrastructure. It's not quite that cut and dried, but it's just sort of understanding there's different, different characteristics or capacities to, to relate to different assets. Um, this is a starting point. This is not, this is not the answer, and, I, and don't take it as that. But. Um, yeah, so in, in a little bit more detail, and these are just some of the principles that emerge from, from, from the research about uh, flexibility and diversity. Um, uh, so 
uh, a resilient system has key assets and functions distributed, so they're not all affected by a given event. Uh, redundancy and modularity, that's kind of self-explanatory, but there's a lot of thinking about how can bits of systems be replaced um, if, they f if they fail or if, they, if they're not, not functioning. Um, and safe failure is quite an um, engineering term, and we've talked about whether it should be safe failure or progressive failure. But it's basically, if, um, if your system, and this is from a system perspective, stops working or is hit by a, a shock, does it stop working immediately or does it progressively fail? And those who've worked in um, seismic, uh, seismic zones would, would understand this from a building's perspective. But it, but it applies to systems as well. Uh, so, and then from a more capacity side, ability to learn, ability to sort of reorganise, visualise and act to the sort of strategies. Do, do, your, do your systems, do the elements in your system have the ability to sort of um, see what's happening and, and sort of respond? and uh, sort of reorganise and the sort of responsiveness and the speed at which that happens. These are all kinds of characteristics which we, which we think are, um, make a system more resilient than, than one that doesn't have these. Questions? We're all very silent. John, you're not allowed to ask questions. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. But there's there's a there's a long uh, there's a lots of research around this and um, long lists and etc. But it's just a sort of starting point for thinking about making a system more um, more resilient. So let's get back to case studies. Let's get back to reality. Uh, abstract and theory is always very nice, but there's good examples from, and I'll talk through two examples and then we'll we'll get into some um, some action. So the case study from Indore in India. Uh, so the water for the city is pumped from hundreds of kilometres away, huge pipelines, massive energy, energy use. Uh, so it's a remote ecosystem requires significant infrastructure. And if you th think back to the, the hamburger, I'm sort of working through some of those, um, some of those sort of elements of the city. Um, so obviously significant energy required. So there's a kind of um, interaction between the water system and the energy system, clearly, and Obviously, uh, sorry, and again you have uh, institutional arrangements. I, what are, the, what are the, the reasons why that water actually comes? Is it, is it a financial relationship? Are there sort of rules and codes around the design of the infrastructure and the way it works and when it works and how it works? Um, and uh, again, it's an expensive and not always reliable system. If the, if the power fails, there's no water. It's quite simple. Um, so on the other side, Within the city, the informal settlements are not linked to this piped water. So while a majority of the residents of the city can turn a tap and receive their water when the system's working, informal settlements have no access to this. So how do they, how do they access their water? So you've got things like tanked water markets, private operators going out to different sources of water and bringing that in. And I guess, again, illustrating the, the sort of breakdown of the city, you need the infrastructure, which is in this case uh, tankers, um, private tankers, uh, trucks, but also the knowledge. Where are the needs? Where are the markets? How do you determine when, where, um, where the water is needed when? What are the kind of knowledge networks that enable that? And uh, one, of the, one of the issues around, um, around that kind of structure is that if, if the water does fail, if the water system, if the, if the pipe water system fails, then where do you think the tanked water markets go? They go to where the money is, very simply. So you've got a situation where the, the, a private water market is going to go where the money is. It doesn't have any responsibility necessarily to go to your local communities who are not, not tapped in. So you have a situation where you're not tapped into, a, if you're an informal settlement, you're not tapped into pi piped water, and then your private tanker market disappears. Traditionally, uh, a lot of the Communities in Indore and, and around the world have used groundwater, bore water, uh, community wells as a way of sourcing local water supplies. And these, um, because of access to tanker water, you can somebody drops off your water at your door as opposed to having to walk to, to a, a well. Um, they're becoming less used, but also polluted through, um, through various operations in the city. So it's a kind of, I guess, snapshot of, of where the city is. Um, what we 
have tried to do from an urban systems perspective is, if you think about the hamburger, turn it on its side. So this is the particular outcome that you're trying to achieve, access to safe water supply. And you've got an ecosystem at this end. This might be several ecosystems, this might be several sources of water. You have infrastructure that we've, we've kind of talked about. We have the water infrastructure, the pipes, the, um, there's boreholes. You've got sort of trucked water um, and sort of treatment storage recycling. You've all these things kind of exist as um, maybe not so much this one, but some sort of storage examples. Your infrastructure exists to a large degree in the city. Your institutional arrangements, you have water governance structures for formal sectors, maybe less so for the informal sectors, but some of those exist. So we're, we're starting to understand how the system's starting to work. In the case of, of, of indoor, the issue was around, and we're focusing on the informal settlements here, so there's again the interplay between um, poverty and, and climate. So we're focusing on the informal settlements, the ones who have least access to, to water. And what can they do? Yes, they could go down a sort of rainwater harvesting kind of pathway, take a sort of infrastructure perspective. Um, they could apply for, you know, could sort of get, uh, get political, start trying to uh, extend the piped water supply to them, trying to get some political representation. But in this case, the, the, wor the work's been focused on increasing knowledge networks. So communities know, have known previously how to access local water supplies. And so there's a, a range of education processes have been, have been put into place, the kind of interventions, where do we intervene? So say, what are the other sources of supply? What are the issues that, um, where can you get that water from? And, and how do you understand that? How do you start influencing back up, back through the system? Um, as a result of your network knowledge, linking communities together, where is the water coming from? Um, building tools, methods, understanding of water resource situations. So it's actually getting to, and this is a, um, this is a specific uh, water system of provision, but how can we build capacities within that system? Um, and I think I flicked over too fast. But in this, in this case, in terms of the characteristics that we were talking about, I mean, we've talked previously about the sort of linked energy supply, inc linked systems. But in terms of characteristics, you've got to, you end up with a diversity of water sources through this supply, um, potentially redundancy in supply systems, uh, the capacity of the community to sort of mobilise and respond. They know what their options are. They, they know what's working and what's not. And potentially the, the capacity to learn from past experiences of bringing back sort of traditional knowledge as well as linking to future, um, future opportunities, I suppose. It's one way of breaking down the system.